Well, <laughs> um, y'all are crazy. Um, well, we're wrapping up our sermon series uh, that we started a couple of weeks ago called Handle Money Like a Grown-Up. If you are joining us for the first time, um, I'd encourage you to go and listen to the messages. They, 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 were, they were really helpful, I, I think, especially as I've had conversations with a few of you. Um, you found it to be very practical, and I've gotten some encouraging messages with folks just saying, hey, I, we paid off debt, or uh, we're really thinking through how to uh, use our, our, our rands and cents uh, in a better way, in a more strategic way. And so it looks... It sounds like you guys are actually starting to put all this stuff together, which is, which is great. Uh, that's the, the hope and the purpose of this series. But uh, today we land the plane. Uh, we're talking about how to make more, all right? How to make more. Permit me to pray. I'm going to pray for you, or that you pray for me, uh, that God would do a work that only He can do this morning. And so, Father God, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for this sermon series that we've been able to navigate through. Um, we thank you. Uh, for how you are at work uh, in and through our lives. And, and so we're asking that you would do that very thing again uh, here this morning. Uh, for those who don't know you as Lord and Savior, God, would you save? Uh, for those who've walked in hurting, would you heal? Uh, for those who uh, feel like they are torn apart, would you restore? Uh, would you do the work? In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Now there's a quote that we've uh, been kind of unpacking, uh, literally this entire sermon series, one could say comes from this quote. I've shared it with you every week, and so I'm going to share it with you one more time. In many ways, it summarizes our entire sermon series. It's by John Wesley, and he says, get all you can without hunting your soul, your body, or your neighbor. Save all you can, cutting off every needless expense. Give all you can, be glad to give and ready to distribute, laying up in store for yourselves a good foundation against the time to come that you may attain eternal life. John Wesley is basically saying, make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. And my prayer throughout this sermon series uh, for all of us has been, God, would you accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think? Would you do far more abundantly then all that we could ask or think, would you do above and beyond all that we can ask or think in our lives, and would that translate into our financial lives? I've been praying that uh, for each and every one of us. God, would you do hashtag more? Would you do hashtag more? And so today, as we close out our series, we're talking about making more, making more Money. Now, I know this sounds a little strange to say, right? It's, for me, it's a little bit weird to talk about making more money in church. But, but here's why I believe we can say it. And in fact, we should confidently say it. It's because if you are a follower of Jesus, you should want to make the most that you can while making the biggest difference in the world. You, you, you want to make the most that you can while making the biggest difference in the world. If you were with us at the beginning of the year, I hope you'll remember a sermon that we walked through where we saw that God calls us to be fruitful. God calls us to be fruitful. God has given us, his children, the ability to be fruitful, to enjoy fruitfulness, and then to increase in fruitfulness. And this can translate to your financial reality. Now, it's important to say some people purposely choose to earn less. I wanted to say that up front. Some people purposely choose to earn less because that is God's direction for their life. And it may be for a season or for their entire lifetime. For example, pastoral ministry. Like, be very weary of the person that goes, you know what, I, I, I want to be a pastor because I'm, I'm going to be so wealthy. Right? Like, let's be honest. It's like, mm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. And so maybe you find multiple streams of income. I don't know. But, but, but there are some professions that, that you just, you're going, I'm not going to make this enormous amount of money. Stay-at-home parents. There are various occupations where that is the reality. 
But in the context of what God has called us to do, we should be deeply asking ourselves, how can we best steward what he has given us? our time, our talents, and our treasures. God, how, how can we be fruitful with these things? How can we multiply these things? We can take a look at the parable of the miners in Luke chapter 19, verse 11 to 27, or the parable of the talents found in Matthew 25, verse 14 to 13. Both these passages address this. You see, the issue on money can be somewhat a forbidden topic, especially in the church. And talking about how to make more, well, well now, now we're in deep waters. If just talking about money is like, I don't know if we should do that. Talking about how to make more money, it's like, whoa, what? I didn't know that Rooted was that kind of church. T- telling people that they can and should desire to make more can, can, can be somewhat unthinkable in the church. And today, today, we are going to do the unthinkable. We are going to do the unimaginable. We're going to do the inconceivable. But like we do here at Rooted, we're going to dig in the Scriptures. We're going to dig in the Scriptures. Because I want you to see that this concept of, of making more is a biblical concept. Making more, it's a, it's a biblical one. And all of this, all of this that we're going to talk about is for a greater purpose. Making more is for a greater purpose. This this making more, it's it's more than just for you. It's more than just for self-gratification. We should desire to make more for the right reasons. Remember, we said that money is a tool. We spoke about this in the first sermon, that money is a tool. And it gives us the ability to do things. And with it, we can do good things and we can do bad things. We can use it to make much of ourselves or we can use it to make much of God. For for, for example, uh, and I've said it a few times from up here, we should think of money as ammunition that we throw at the kingdom of darkness as the kingdom of light advances. So so we should think of our money that way. It's like it's an opportunity to advance the kingdom. It's it's a tool that we have to advance the kingdom of God. We we give to missions. We give to church planting. We give to ministry in the city. We give to Bible translators so that more and more people can read God's word for themselves. It's a tool. We can use money to provide for the poor the widow, the orphan, and the displaced foreigner. We we can use money to build infrastructure for those who don't have, so that we might be able to instill in them dignity. We can use money for good or for bad. So we should all be seeking to increase our earning potential so that we might use it for the glory of God. All of us, all of us, all of us should be seeking to increase our earning potential so that we might increase our kingdom impact. That's what it's about. We should be encouraging one another to maximize our potential to make as much as we can to impact as many as we can. But too often the sad reality in the church is we're not shown how to do this. We'll, we'll talk about it, but, but we're not told how to do this. We're not given the necessary steps to be able to do this. We've been left to try and figure it out on our own. We allow the, the systems of the world to dictate how we are to do this. Forgetting that We have been beautifully designed for fellowship. And so in this very room are people with incredible gifts who have the ability to show us how to maximize our earning potential. And so we should be capitalizing on that. In fact, yesterday was an incredible morning for those who were here. To, to hear from two people who call Rooted Fellowship home saying, listen, we, we want to make sure that you guys know how to handle money like a grown-up. 
And in that, they, they want to show us how to maximize our earning potential. And so if I was to summarize this sermon, I would summarize it this way. We need to know how to apply wisdom so we can get a plan and then execute that by seeking the Lord. We need to apply wisdom, get a plan, and then seek the Lord. Do these things, and I believe you will see results. If you apply wisdom, get a plan, and seek the Lord. If you do these things, you will see results. Now, look, I can't be specific about them, right? Because all of us love results. Like, okay, on how much will I make? Ex- I, I don't know. I don't know what the Lord has for you. But he will do something in and through you. If you seek the Lord and his will on this matter, he will intervene and instruct you on how to make more so that you might impact more. But you must be clear on the ultimate goal of making more. You have to, you have to, you have to be clear on the ultimate goal of making more. And that is to glorify God and to make him known. It is to glorify God and to make him known. If you take your eyes off that, then you're in big trouble. We want to glorify God and we want to make him known. And so I have five things for you today, just five. It's not an exhaustive list, but we need to start somewhere. And so I'm going to give you five. Five things that are found in Scripture that I believe we must do if we want to increase our earning potential, if we want to make more so that we might impact more. Here's five things that I think we should do. Number one, get the right mindset. Get the right mindset. It's important to understand the why behind the idea of making all you can. And it's not about chasing money or a lifestyle. That's not what it's about. In making all we can, we're not chasing money for money's sake. Instead, we are looking to make more of an impact in this world for the sake of the kingdom so that God might be able to rescue more people. That's what we want to see. We want to see God rescuing more people out of darkness into his light from being an orphan to becoming a child of the kingdom. We need to get the right mindset. Jesus says this in Matthew 6 verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We're told here that we have a a choice between God and money. And and, and as, as, as a master, one leads to the abundant life, and the other leads to a path of destruction. Money is a tool. It's not the goal. It's a tool. Money, money, money makes a terrible master. A terrible master. But a great servant. A great servant. And so in your hands, in, in the hands of someone who has the right mind, who understands why, why we're doing this, man, money will be a great servant in your hands. A little side note. Money, money amplifies your character. So, so if you want to be here going, you know what, I, I wish I had more. First check your character. Because what you're saying is, I'm about to put this on display. Money amplifies your character. Uh, author Mike, I'm not going to try to say his last name, um, so we'll just call him Mikey. Mikey says this. <laughs> money amplifies your character. It is that simple. It allows you to repeat ingrained habits easily. And unless you develop a strong, humble character coupled with good habits, more and more money will become more and more of a problem. Money has no judgment. It enables you to be more of you. It, it enables you to be more of you. So, so, so if you are greedy and selfish with 50 rand, guess what? With 500 million rand, you are going to be greedy and selfish. But if you are generous with 50 rand, 
Oh, you are, you are going to be an incredibly generous person with 500,000. Money allows you to be more of you. That's what it does. And so the question is, who are you? Who are you? Please make all you can. But do it with the right mindset. Do it with the right mindset. Number two, discover and develop your gifts and assignments. Discover and develop your gifts and assignments. Now, now some people like to talk about calling. I like to talk about assignments. Let me tell you why. People are always like, what's my calling? God, what have you called me to do? And, and you sit and you look to the heavens and you go, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And he's going, I've already told you. If you're a child of God, you have a call. In fact, all of us, all of us have the same calling. It is to glorify God and to make him known. It's to glorify God and to make him known. We've been given the great commission. Yeah. Now go. Amen. And yet many of us are going, I don't, I don't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. No, you're supposed to be making disciples. Sharing the good news of Jesus with everyone. Amen. Trusting him that he will do a work in them and draw them to himself. And then you disciple. And then they go and do likewise. That's the calling. And all of us, all of us have the same calling. But we have different assignments. Yeah. See, some of you work in corporate. That's your assignment. Some of you are in government. That's your assignment. Some of you all have a fat. That's your assignment. We have multiple assignments. We have one calling. And so you need to discover and develop your gifts and assignments. I like to talk about self-awareness. If you want to get me excited, come and ask me about self-awareness. This has got to do with the principle of self-awareness. Take time to know who you are. I think because we're so bombarded by social media, the whole time we're trying to be someone else. We're always looking over, it's like, oh, what, what are they like? What's that? Oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll have that. No, who are you? Take time to figure that out. Discover and develop your gifts and assignments. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 10 says this, For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from work so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. See, the, the word workmanship here is translated in other versions as masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. The actual Greek word is poema, which is where we get the word poem. So we are God's poetry in motion. God's poetry in motion. Look, I get it. You know, for all the nature freaks in the house, I get it. Nature is beautiful. The mountains are incredible. The bush is amazing at night. Just to let you know, you can see all those things on Google. You don't have to travel as far, but anyway. <laughs> the sun and the moon and the stars, mind-blowing mind-blowing but we we you and I are God's ultimate workmanship that as amazing as those things are it's us it's us that I believe the angels look and go wow yeah. wow the great African theologian saying Augustine said this, men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the rivers, at the vast compass of the season, at the circular motion of the stars, and they pass by themselves without wondering. And they pass by themselves without wondering. Friends, we are made in the image of God. We are his masterpiece, his workmanship. And yet, however, let me preach here for a moment. However, 
as wondrous as humanity is, I believe the ultimate workmanship of God is a human being who, despite being dead in their transgressions and sin, has been made alive in Christ. That, that every human being is created and held together by Christ, yes. But a second work in Christ Jesus must occur. That, that you are, yes, you are, you are formed into the image of God, but, a, but a, second, a second process must occur. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. And this is made possible because he who knew no sin became sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's why for those who are in Christ, there is now no condemnation. The second, the second creation, that yes, you are beautiful, you're amazing, but because of sin, things things aren't the way that they should be. And so we need to surrender our lives to Jesus. Completely, completely, so that a second work can happen. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So not only are you his workmanship, but you are his workmanship created for a -a one-of-a-kind mission, the greatest adventure you'll ever be on. Oh, I I say this and I know sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. It's like, oh no, you have no idea what I'm up to. What I'm up to is the most incredible thing in the world. If it's not making disciples, it goes second. And a far second. You are on the greatest adventure. I don't get it. When Christians go, I'm bored. I'm like, I don't understand. How? How are you bored? We should be trying to figure out, like, how can we make our way into government so that we might be able to be salt and light to share the good news with those who are in parliament? That'll, I don't know how long that's going to take, but we need to figure it out. I'm in corporate, so how can, I, how can I be in the space so that people can come to the saving knowledge of the grace of Jesus? You are made to be more. You are made to be more and do more, perhaps more than you could ever imagine. If, if that's what you're going to get this morning, then, then man, I hope, I hope it, it, it gets solidified in you. That you've been, you've, been, you've been made for more. God gave you good works, a unique contribution to the advancing of his kingdom in the world. And then we're told he prepared these ahead of time for you to do. It's it's not like, where did you come from? Okay, what does the manual say? So, born in South Africa in the 80s, let me see, let's try to find something. No, that's not what's happening. He, He prepared these good works for you to do ahead of time. Ponder that for a moment. That means that there are no mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I know some people have some really dark stories of how they ended up here. But, but for God, there are no mistakes. There are no whoopsies. I know some of y'all, some of y'all are whoopsies. It's like, you know, you know, you look, you look at your siblings and you know, okay, the p- planned, <laughs> planned, whoopsie plant. But God is saying, no, 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 with him there are no whoopsies. He knew that you would be here. He, he knew that you would be living in Pretoria, living in Johannesburg, living in Gauteng, living in South Africa in this town. And I know some of us, we go, you know, I wish, I wish I lived in a different era. I wish times are so hard. No, 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 no. God, God's going, you are exactly where you need to be. And I've put some things in you that only you can do as the kingdom advances. Our unique gifts to the world have already been granted. They're there. You have them. We need to seek the Lord, connect the dots, tap into our narrative and discover what that is and then walk in them. 
I talk about you guys all the time. Every time I travel, I talk about you all the time. I believe that one of the most gift, one of the most gifted church. Okay, I'm bragging a little bit, but one of the most gifted church in our city, because of you. You guys are incredibly gifted. But you need to figure that out. You need to mind that. You need to bring it to the Lord. You need to, God, you've made me this way and in this time, in this season. What, like, what is, what's my assignment? I want to be on mission for you. You have something deposited in you that God longs to unlock and let out. He longs to unlock and let out. But you must do the work of discovery and development. You must. You must do the work of discovery and development. This is why we talk about serving here at Root Fellowship. Some of you are like, I don't know where to serve. Then just do everything. Just go, Pastor Jonah, I'd like to do everything. Unless you know for sure that that thing that you love to do is not a public gift. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> like there's a difference between singing in the shower and singing here. Um, massive difference. And you will be exposed. No, but... But, but when we say do, do, do as much as you can, figure, figure it out. Get plugged in. We'll tell you. We'll be like, no, we don't think this is for you. Maybe try this. Maybe try to unlock those. There's various ways. There's various ways. Here's how I like to do it. If we ever sit together at a table and you go, and I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, what, what I should do. I have this thing, uh, concentric circles, right? The concentric circles of affinity. You can throw that up. Uh, it's a pretty picture. Yep, there we go. Affinity, strengths, and opportunities, right? We just sit and we talk through those things. And, and, and you, I always say you want to be in that sweet spot right in the middle. But it takes time. Yeah. There, there, there'll be seasons in your life where you're going, man, where I am at the moment, I think it's just, just my strengths here. But you know what? I'm always trying to figure out how to get to that center. Or maybe there's an opportunity, but it's, it's like, it's, it's just the opportunity. It's not really drawing on the strengths. It's not drawing on my affinities. It's just, but you know what, God, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to do the work. At some point, I know you're going to move me closer and closer to that center. Yeah. Discover your gifts and assignments. Because if you do, I believe that that will change the way that you work. You'll see work differently. Work will go from a have to to a get to. I get to do this. And, and I believe that is what fuels inspiration and drive and opportunity. It'll stop this, oh, I just got to grind, you know, I just got to keep doing this. You can only do that for so long, friends. I'm telling you, you can only do that for so long before everything becomes a pain. And so figure it out, figure it out. Because I think if you do this, then all of a sudden, you, you, you're really good at what you do, which I'm telling you will increase your earning potential. But if you don't, then you'll always just be about the grind and the hustle. And it's weird. It's so, it's, isn't it strange how we, like, we, we, humanity has this ability to turn really painful things into really like interesting hashtags because we're just trying to make it cool because in reality what we're doing is we're just trying to numb the pain. I, I know someone heard that. Right? The grind and the hustle. I'm about the grind and the hustle. No, it's like work is painful for you. It, it really is. It just, it's, it's not great. Okay, number three. You want to make more? Invest in upskilling yourself. Invest in upskilling yourself. Now, at first hearing, this may sound somewhat unbiblical. It's like, ooh, yourself. Anything with yourself must be unbiblical. Now, hold on. Pro Proverbs 18, verse 15 says this. Intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. They're open for knowledge. What, what does this mean? Well, if you want to be intelligent in this world, you must always be ready to learn. You must be. Our ears must be open to knowledge. First, from here. This is where you begin. Because this will give you the ability to discern if the knowledge out there really is knowledge. But if you don't start here, then everything is knowledge to you. Everything. 
You'll walk into exclusive books and you just be like, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take on oh, mind, body, and soul. I'll take that. I'll take. And then you just put it together and you're like, I'm going to create. You know what you're doing? You're actually creating your own theology with you as your own God. Be open to knowledge, willing to learn. We must seek it out. Be prepared to receive knowledge that will propel us forward in life and work. There's a great African proverb that says this, knowledge is like a garden. If it is not cultivated, you cannot harvest it. You can't. We must keep learning and sharpening our skill, especially once we've locked into our gifts and our assignments. Once you've figured that out, once you've, once you've discovered and you've developed it, then you know what? Upskill yourself. When we perpetually upskill ourselves to learn and grow in our field, we put ourselves on a path to becoming vital. You become vital. You become essential, essential to the entity or the organization or the department. You become essential to the environment. And you know what that does? That puts you in a position to increase your earning potential. When people go, you know what, we need so-and-so. We need so-and-so to do this thing. And, and, and you're, not, you're not showing up going, yeah, because I'm the best in the world. No, it's because you come there with a humble heart going, you know what, I, I love what I do. God's wired me to do this. And when I do it, it's, it's like I'm worshiping him. Yeah. Massive difference. Invest in upskilling yourself. Number four, work for God, not for people. Work for God, not for people. So some people will hear this and think, oh, great, that gives me permission to be lazy, right? Because I'm setting boundaries. I've got boundaries, guys. I'm all for boundaries. I really am. But I think many of us, we say that just to be like, oh, just, then I, I don't have to do X, Y, Z, you know? I'm working for the Lord, so therefore I don't have to be respectful at work. I don't have to respect you, you know, because I'm respecting the Lord. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Yeah. Don't be disrespectful. You, you know, if you're going to be disrespectful at work, that's a whole different sermon. That's learning how to decrease your earning potential, <laughs> right? <laughs> Definitely come to that sermon. It'll be great. Don't do that. And, and I understand that some of you are in toxic environments. I totally get that. So some of you, you, you work for uh, an employer who is not a Christian. In fact, they're not even in the ambiguous middle. They're just like, you know what? I hate anything that has to do with Christianity. Like, I get that. I get that. So what do you do? You need to seek the Lord and say, God, give me the right words. Give me the right posture. H how do I navigate through this? Get some people around you and, and tell them, this is, this is what I'm going through. How do I do this? You, you'll be blown away how some people in here will go, you know what? I went through the same thing about two years ago. Here's what I did. Work for God, not for people. Colossians 3, verse 23 to 24 says this. Whatever you do, do it from the heart. As something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Christ. See, our temptation and tendency, when we don't enjoy what we're doing, or we think no one is watching, is to do it half-hearted. And, I, and I think... I think I think the church suffers greatly from this. B because, because we're not paying you to be here. You're not, you're not being paid to serve. It's different when it's like, you know, I, I, I got to, I gotta, you know, they're paying me at work, so I need to, you know, I need to, I need to, but you know, for the things that, ah, whatever, it's like, can you put that chair there? There, I put it. It's there. Why are they always complaining? The chair's there. The chair, well, the chair's not, it's not straight. It's not in a, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, no, but it doesn't matter, guys. It's not, we're half-hearted about everything. The pursuit of excellence goes out the window. I get it. We're not perfect. We are imperfect human beings all pointing one another to a perfect Savior, but there should be a pursuit of excellence in what we do. Yeah. Why? Because what we do is, is for the Lord. It's us worshiping Him. Friends, the children of God should be noticeably different. The, 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 the people of God should be noticeably different. 
It is with this understanding that Paul communicates this to the the church in Colossae. He he says, you you should be different in every arena of life. Not just on a Sunday morning. Some of y'all bring bring your best to a Sunday morning. But there's only two hours. And then the rest of the week you go, I'll do whatever I want. You'll pack chairs like a legend. And then at work, you're that person that's just like, hey, do you want to work with so-and-so in a team? No, 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 no. If you're always working on your own, it might be, it might be because you should work well as if you're working for Jesus at everything that you do. And here's why. Because you are working for Jesus. Regardless of whether you have a good boss or a bad boss, a good salary or a poor one, whether you're passionate about your work or you're doing something for just the season, it doesn't matter. You're working for Jesus. In all circumstances, we are called to work in a way that brings God glory. And then it helps produce flourishing for others. We must do our work wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. Work diligently with integrity and honesty, not just when your supervisor is watching. And by by the way, your supervisor is always watching. (laughs) There's a show called Undercover Boss. It's really interesting. It's about, it's hilarious. Like this this boss goes into his his own business, but dresses different. He goes undercover and then he works with the people and sees. Like it's funny. It's funny when you, like some people are just like, the boss is not here. But your supervisor is always around. The Holy Spirit is always around. Always watching, always listening, always engaging. My friend and and, and mentor, Leon Crump, says this. He says, displaying your new life in Christ, complete with heavenly thoughts, a renewed mind, and an altered orientation around Jesus himself, changes the way you work, why you work, and for whom you work. Working heartily as for the Lord and not for people, this honors God. And he sees it. He sees it. And in time, God will see it fit to position you for more. In time. He'll go, you know, this is one of my faithful ones. They work with integrity. They work as if they're working for me. Oh, I could do more. I could do more with this one. Number five, last one. Send your grain across the seas. You want to increase your earning potential? Send your grain across the seas. Now, we looked at this passage two weeks ago in our sermon, Save More. And remember, I said to you that we'd come back to this one and I'd unpack the rest. Ecclesiastes verse 11, verses 1 to 2 says, this, Send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. Back then, we focused on verse 2, but divide your investments among many places, for you do not know what risks may lie ahead. We spoke about diversification. But but here, verse 1, send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. Some translations say, cast your bread upon the waters. Cast your bread upon, no, that's not what it means. So, so what, is this, what does this mean? Well, one view is that this command to cast your bread upon the waters, it, it has to do with international trade. The principle is that if you invest your bread or grain wisely in a broad enough market, you will gain a return. Okay, maybe. Another view says this, that this instruction to cast your bread upon the waters is a metaphor for being generous even if a return seems unlikely. And in my study of this passage, I I lean more to the second view. Sending grain across the sea seems pointless. It seems borderline ridiculous. But Solomon says, do it. Even if you don't know what the actual results will be, do it in faith and be generous. And in faith, expect a return somewhere down the road. Definitely in the life to come, and who knows, maybe in the life that we're living now. Solomon is taking us to the biblical principle of sowing and reaping. King Solomon is, 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 he's talking about risk. However, wise Solomon is encouraging us to take wise risks. If you are ever to make more to make a difference in this world, it will require you to take wise risks. Let me say that again. If you are ever to make more 
to make a difference in this world, it will require you to take wise risks. This, this is something we understand as a society. We do. Because it's often said that entrepreneurs are risk takers. But, but, but they're the ones that generally change the world. They change the way that we do things. But they are risk takers. It, it takes a certain level of bravery and confidence to take the plunge into entrepreneurship, into starting something new and to make it successful. Taking risks is often seen as something to be feared. But when done correctly, it can lead to great rewards. Here's some of the advantages of taking wise risks. Number one, new opportunities. You open the door to new opportunities. Number two, valuable experiences. You learn so much. Number three, increased innovation. You're helping others do better, do more. And then lastly, financial success. So take wise risks. Let me read a few more verses. Ecclesiastes 11 from one to say, send your grain across the seas, and in time profits will flow back to you. But divide your investments among many places, for you do not know what risks might lie ahead. When clouds are heavy and the rains come down, whether a tree falls north or south, it stays where it falls. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. If you procrastinate, waiting for the perfect situation, you will end up doing nothing. You've got to take wise risks. And, and this is the same with regards to earning, like increasing your earning potential. You've, you've, you've got to take risks. Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. Like, we should stop trying to put God in a box. As Christians, we do really strange things where the world looks at us and goes, that's really, really strange. And we're going, yeah, because we serve a God who doesn't necessarily fit into the boxes that we've created here. And so we'll do something. We spoke about it last week when, in giving more. Like, like when God says, hey, bring the 10th. And then what I'll do in return is I'll open up the floodgates. Like, that, wait, wait, with just a 10th? Yes. Start somewhere. Be willing to take that risk. Plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon. So, so you plant and then you work. Many of us, we go, I'm going to try and then I'm just going to look at it and wait. No farmer does that. They, they plant in faith expecting something to grow. But then they also work. And I think that work is in preparation of what is to come. We, we, we plant a church in expectation that God's going to do something. Yeah. We share our faith in expectation that God's going to yeah. do something. Yeah. We start something new in expectation that God's going to do something. Wisdom tells us that we are not in control and that God holds time and space in His hands, that He is in control. So that's who we put our trust in. Yeah. All people of significant impact have taken wise risks. I'll show you quickly. Esther took a wise risk in standing up for her people to the king when they faced destruction, even though she might be killed for confronting him. She took a wise risk. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took a wise risk to stand against the king of Babylon and refused to bow down to him because they were only going to bow down to one true king. And that's God. They faced the fiery furnace for their decision but came out unharmed. They took a risk. The Apostle Paul took a wise risk in standing against the Jews who incorrectly believed that one could only be saved by obedience to the law of God instead of faith in Jesus. And so on and so on and so on. We are here because a group of people took a wise risk. But look what it increased to. Jesus started with 12. And yet here we are. So take wise risks. Do not live life as though the goal of life is to arrive safely at death. Oh, you, you want it one more time? Okay. Do not live life as though the goal of life is to arrive safely at death. As terrifying as some <laughs> might think this sounds, let me ask you, what is the cost of no action? What is the cost of doing nothing? The cost is far more than we might imagine. And included in that cost is not living the life God has for us and others. So those are the five things. I'm going to call the band up to come and close us out. If you want to increase your earning potential, get the right mindset. Discover and develop your gifts and assignments. 
Invest in upskilling yourself. Work for God and not for people. And then send your grain across the seas. Send your grain across the seas. I have no idea what that looks like for you. I don't. But we can start a conversation and figure it out. If you're willing to do these five things, I believe you will put yourself on a path to making more so that you can make an even greater impact in the world. Let me me close on this matter of risk. The wisest risk that you can take today is entirely unrelated to your earning potential. It's a matter of your eternity. I know we're talking about money, we're talking about resources, and, and yes, I want you to make more, more than you could ever imagine so that you could have more of an impact in this world. I do, I want that for you. I really do. But maybe for you, it's like, I need to sort out my character first. I need to get the right mindset first. I need to discover my uh, gifts and calling. That's where I am in this thing. Or maybe for you, is you need to in, invest in upskilling yourself. Maybe you need to recognize that, you know what, I'm working for God and not for people. I, I need to stop this thing where it's all about me. I don't know what you need to do, but do something. But more important than that is eternity. The risk of accepting Jesus' invitation to give your whole life to Him and to live every day in a relationship with Him, choosing to trust Him, follow Him, care for the things that He cares about. That's a risk worth taking. Jesus came to earth and gave His life for you and me so that we might be completely free. Jesus wants good for you in every area of your life. He does. And so the question this morning is, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Are you willing to let go because you believe your life in His hands is way better than what you're trying to do? He wants you to flourish. He wants you to experience the abundant life in this world and beyond. And so will you risk it all? Will you risk it all and accept his invitation? Because I'm telling you, you'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. You'll experience more than this world has to offer. Something that all the money in the world cannot buy. You will experience the plentiful, bountiful, overflowing, magnanimous, abundant life. That's what hashtag more is about, is to experience the abundant life that is found in Jesus. And so what now? Apply wisdom, get a plan, seek the Lord. But it's that seek the Lord that I want to land this plan on. If you know that you're not a Christian, maybe you've been in Christian environments, you've always gone to church, you've always been in a a city group or community group, you're familiar with the Bible, but you know you have not released it all to Jesus, that you have not surrendered your entire life to Jesus. It's easy to go, Jesus, you can have my emotions, but you can't have my money. Jesus, you you can have my my intellect, but you can't have my relationships. No, Jesus goes, I want it all because I died for it all. And so if that's you, then this morning is an opportunity for you to surrender it, to let go and to say, God, I trust you. I receive Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I, I receive. You don't have to know everything. You don't always have to have all the dots connected. No, it's simple. Jesus loves you more than you could ever imagine. He died for you. And all you have to say is yes to him. Massive risk. Incredible returns. But maybe you have surrendered your life to Jesus, but you found yourself wondering. You've taken your eyes off him. You're doing your own thing. And it's not coming together. And so you just do more and more and more and more. And it just leaves you empty and empty and empty. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will take a hold of your heart and say, back to Jesus. Back to Jesus. I know it's painful, but back to Jesus. 
I know it hurts, but back to Jesus. I know you feel alone, but back to Jesus. Seek the Lord. I believe if you respond to this call, you will stand a greater chance to make a greater kingdom impact. You will enjoy everything that you do, including your work. Because you'll understand that you're on the greatest adventure of your life. You will do more than just get by. You'll want to leave a legacy. An inheritance for your children's children. You will always want to give your first and best. Because you recognize that you've received God's first and best in Jesus. I want him to open up the floodgates for you. You'll position yourself to earn more and create more opportunities for others. You will truly experience the abundant life. That's my prayer for each and every one of us. And so, Father God, I ask that you would do this work in and through us. Lord, we thank you for this sermon series that we've walked through to handle money like a grown-up. And we've picked up some helpful tools along the way and, and many of us are, are putting those into practice but, but more important than all those things is our relationship with you. And so God, would you meet us where we are, each and every single person in here. It's not about what other people think about us, God, it's about what you think about us. And your word has made it clear to us you love us so much so that you sent your son to come and die for us that you long for a relationship with us and that in you is life and life everlasting and so father we thank you we praise you we give you all the glory in jesus beautiful name we pray